right, good morning, everybody. Uh, I am not Dr. Olson. Uh, Mike Olson couldn't be here today, and so he asked me to present our speaker for today. My name is Michael Shishov, and I'm Division Chief of Pediatric Rheumatology, so I'll be uh, introducing our speaker for today, uh, Dr. Cleo Ede, who is a longstanding member of our division here in rheumatology. Dr. Ede completed his undergraduate training at Occidental College, which uh, for you political nerds is where Barack Obama graduated from. Didn't graduate. Oh, good correction there, Dr. Reed. But he went there. Okay. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, then uh, Dr. Eid completed his med school training at University of Hawaii, followed by a med peds residency here at PCH for four years, including a chief residency and uh, fellowship training at UCLA. Uh, lucky for me, he took his faculty job here in 2008 and has been here ever since. Uh, while here, Dr. Reed has participated in numerous research, uh, clinical trials and registries as an investigator or co-investigator. He also has extensive community service, including service as chair of the Arthritis Foundation in uh, Arizona for four years. Um, Dr. Ede will be speaking to you today about uh, the latest developments in juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Dr. Ede. All right. Good morning, everybody. Is this loud enough? Can everybody hear this? It seems soft. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for joining me this morning. This is really going to be kind of a state-of-the-art type of talk on uh, treatment and kind of management of juvenile idiopathic arthritis. So I'll briefly be discussing some off-label uses of uh, treatments available for juvenile idiopathic arthritis. And I'm going to be sharing both uh, facts and my opinions or other people's opinions. And I've tried to delineate that uh, by using red font for opinions. So we'll start off with a quick case. It's a 13-year-old girl with newly diagnosed rheumatoid factor negative polyarticular juvenile idiopathic arthritis. She was recently started on uh, medication for that, oral methotrexate. Oral methotrexate. And uh, the first question that her parents want to know is, will she grow out of this? So uh, we have the Poll Everywhere survey. So if you uh, pull out your cell phones and you text PCH MedEd to the number 2233 when you join, and then you can choose yes or no if you think children grow out of JIA. some consensus. Uh, looks like majority feel that uh, children do not grow out of JIA, which would be the correct answer. So. so with that in mind, I wanted to briefly go over what I'm going to talk about this morning. Uh, I'm going to start with some definitions of what JIA is and specifically focusing on our current treatment goal, which is remission and how we define it, how we measure it. I'm gonna talk about uh, where we are now in terms of the tools we have to get to remission and uh, exactly how well we're doing with getting to remission. And then at the end of the talk, I wanna talk about um, some future plans uh, in terms of how we get to remission using different research networks and collaborative networks, as well as a completely different way of looking at uh, treatment for juvenile arthritis. Oops. So definitions. So juvenile idiopathic arthritis is really a group of diseases. It's not just one disease. Uh, they are a genetically diverse um, 
phenotypically diverse, and they are all immune-mediated. And the three key features that link these diseases together are that the symptoms really need to start before age 16. It has to be a chronic form of arthritis, so going on for at least six weeks or more in at least one joint. And then you need to exclude other causes of arthritis because there is no specific diagnostic test. And that's something we focus on when we have residents and medical students come through our rotation is really uh, talking about the fact that it's a diagnosis of exclusion. It used to be called juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. It's what most people know it as. In 1993, a international group decided that there was confusion because there were, uh, the group from the United States were calling it juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. A group from Europe was calling it juvenile chronic arthritis. So JIA became the uh, unified term that we now use. It's really an umbrella term uh, that focuses on seven different type, different diseases. Uh, three of the diseases make a lot of sense, and they are uh, broken down by the number of joints that are involved. So oligoarthritis is uh, a disease that happens with four or less joints uh, within the first six months. And then polyarthritis is if they present in the first six months with five or more joints. And that's further broken down by a autoantibody called the rheumatoid factor, whether it's positive or negative. On the other side is a little more uh, diverse group of diseases included enthesitis-related arthritis, which is another name for spondyloarthritis or juvenile ankylosing spondylitis. And it presents with axial disease in some cases, primarily the sacroiliac joint, as well as enthesitis, which is inflammation where tendons insert into the bones. Specifically, the Achilles tendon is often involved. And then arthritis that is accompanied by psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis, as well as systemic onset JIA, which is a disease uh, unto itself involving fevers and rashes and sericitis. And then kind of a wastebasket term at the bottom, undifferentiated arthritis, which is where uh, arthritis uh, is either doesn't meet any of these criteria or it meets more than one of these different subtypes. So a couple key concepts with JIA. It's a common problem. There are about 300,000 children in the U.S., about 7,000 children in Arizona. The age of onset uh, can be at any point. It's exceedingly rare, less than six months, but the peak age of onset really depends on the subtype. Most of the subtypes have onset within uh, age one to five, uh, but there can be a bimodal distribution in uh, the rheumatoid factor positive patients where teenagers are often affected as well. Again, there is no diagnostic test. This is a rule in disease, not a rule out disease. You can never really rule out JIA. You have to rule out other diseases before you can rule this disease in. You can have other manifestations. I mentioned the fevers, rashes, um, uveitis, or inflammation of the eyes. And the outcome is really, at this point, impossible to predict for an individual. It's a very individual-based disease. Talk about those definitions in general. Uh, remission comes from the Latin word remittere, which means to send back or to decrease or to relax. And when we talk about remission in diseases in general, it's really the state of absence of disease activity in patients who have a chronic disease with always the possibility the disease could return and become more active again. So when you talk about curing, that means the disease is not coming back, and currently we don't have a cure in JIA. We want to arrest the disease progression. Uh, flare is when uh, the disease uh, activity increases substantially, and a, a relapse is, again, similar to a flare where there's a return of disease activity. Problems with defining remission in inflammatory arthritis and JIA. There's no gold standard measure at this point. Um, children, uh, in, um, in addition to adults, but more so in children, can have spontaneous remission occur without treatment. It's not common, but it does happen. Exactly how long you need to be 
without disease activity to uh, determine that you're in re remission is, is difficult to define. And children who've had bad disease activity early on and then the activity subsides but still have damage from that disease activity can have signs of, uh, of chronic inflammation that may not actually be new disease activity and it can be hard to account in terms of defining if they're in remission because of this previous disease damage. So often with uh, pediatrics in general, we look to our adult colleagues for um, guidance on how to define uh, difficult to define measures. And so in adults, in rheumatoid arthritis, 2011, this group called the American College of Rheumatology, which is really our unifying uh, group, as well as the European League Against Rheumatism, the European uh, group defined uh, remission in, uh, in rheumatoid arthritis as having uh, te a tender joint count, so when you're pressing on joints, having no tenderness, less than or equal to one, swollen joint count of less than or equal to, to one, and then a patient global assessment, it's kind of a scale of one to 10 or one to 100 for patients to mark um, how in general they feel the disease is, at, is um, uh, affecting them. And the other way to define it is based on a clinical disease activity index, which is a composite score of multiple different factors, including uh, tender and swollen joints, as well as some lab criteria, including the ESR, and then the patient, uh, patient global assessment, as well as uh, physician global assessment. Having a composite score less than 2.8 would define remission in rheumatoid arthritis. Based on these remission criteria, uh, the same group came up with what's called the treat to target recommendations. So this is an approach to managing rheumatoid arthritis. It has four overarching principles. Uh, primarily, it needs to be shared decisions between the doctor and the patient. And the goal is really to maximize long-term quality of life. You want to get rid of all inflammation uh, from the disease and you want to measure disease activity and adjust uh, the therapy to, to get the best outcomes. And so uh, there's 10 general recommendations, most of which can be seen on this slide. So the first thing is to uh, define your target, a clear target, and in most cases it is to achieve remission defined by those uh, criteria I just mentioned. If remission is difficult to obtain, uh, then setting a different goal, such as low disease activity, would be an uh, appropriate alternative to actually having remission. So patients who've had long-standing disease are more difficult to, to treat in general. Uh, so sometimes you have to alter the goal. Uh, you want to um, use different composite measures, disease activity measures, on a regular routine basis, up to every three months, in order to uh, to define how you're doing in terms of meeting your goal. You want to adjust therapy depending on these composite measures. And again, the big thing is this should be a shared decision in terms of setting the goals, setting the therapies uh, with your patient. So what has this treat to target um, approach done? Well, there was a large trial in uh, 2004 called the uh, TACORA trial stands for tight control of rheumatoid arthritis uh, that was out of uh, the United Kingdom that looked at um, whether or not doing a treat to target approach actually improved outcomes and of course it did so you can see here this is kind of an intensive approach uh, using composite measures monitoring patients every three months those patients had lower disease activity than what was at that point in 2004 the standard of care they had uh, a larger percentage of remission. They also found there was less radiographic pro progression. They had better, better physical function overall, and uh, their quality of life improved. And in general, there was no additional cost uh, in terms of monetary uh, with um, this approach. So this has really kind of uh, changed the way adult rheumatologists practice.
So of course, this is a saying that's well known in, in pediatrics that uh, children are not small adults and uh, it's not uh, possible to actually translate these uh, remission criteria directly into JIA. So um, how are we in these days telling um, whether or not a patient has active disease? Well, we bring the patient to the office and we do a history uh, asking about symptoms, including pain and morning stiffness uh, and functional uh, questions. We examine the patients looking for tender joints and swollen joints. Uh, we check lab tests, specifically inflammatory markers such as the erythrocyte sedimentation rate and the C-reactive protein, as well as blood counts. Uh, we use imaging uh, to look for active disease as well, and then we use disease measuring tools. So the measuring tools we have can be broken down into uh, the ones we use almost exclusively in the uh, in uh, studies, clinical trials, and then ones that are more appropriate for use in the clinic as well as clinical trials. So the American College of Rheumatology pediatric 30, 50, 70, and 90 um, are used primarily in clinical trials. They really measure disease activity, uh, a disease, disease improvement over time. So you have to have an initial measurement and then uh, uh, rechecking in three to four weeks or three to four months. And um, it's really an improvement in uh, uh, factors uh, by 30%, 50%, 70%, 90%. And these include things such as uh, tender joint counts, swollen joint counts, inflammatory markers, um, and, uh, and quality of life measures as well. Uh, this is impractical for day-to-day -day use in the, in the clinic, so um, uh, the juvenile arthritis disease activity score was developed that can be used in both clinical trials and in clinical practice. This measures disease activity at a specific point in time when a patient comes into the office. You can uh, classify the disease activity into low, moderate, and high based on um, the score. And again, this is based on specific measures, including uh, tender joint count, uh, active joints in general, as well as um, the physician global assessment score and um, the ESR, or some marker of inflammation. Uh, it's validated only in polyarticular disease and oligoarticular disease, so there, there is a drawback in the sense that it's not used in all seven types of JIA. Another way of determining whether a disease is act active or not is based on a seminal publication by Carol Wallace, who is a pediatric rheumatologist at uh, Seattle Children's, and it's the criteria for clinical inactive disease. So um, these criteria including having no joints with active arthritis, no swollen joints or tender joints or limited range of motion, no uh, systemic symptoms sort of patients who have systemic JIA, no fevers, rashes, or serositis, having no active uveitis, which is a, often a complication of uh, JIA involving the eyes, having normal inflammatory markers, a lack of morning stiffness less than uh, 15 minutes, and then having no uh, disease activity based on a physician's global assessment. These criteria can then be used to define what we mean by clinical remission in JIA. So it's further broken down into whether or not a patient is on medication or off medication. If a patient has been, has been meeting those criteria for inactive disease while taking a medication for six months, they're considered in clinical remission with medication. And if a patient stops their medication, and they remain in inactive disease for 12 months, they are considered to be in clinical remission without medication. Problems with these criteria is, again, they only cover certain categories of JIA, including oligoarticular disease, polyarticular disease, and systemic. We don't involve any imaging in these criteria at all, which can be helpful tools for looking for active disease. And the criteria, again, are based 
on um, w one part of the criteria based solely on physician-centered outcomes, the physician uh, global assessment score, which there was a study in 2017 by uh, our colleagues at Cincinnati Children's that showed that in general, pediatric rheumatologists don't have good um, agreement between uh, patients who are in low disease activity with this physician assessment score. There's really no specific training we have uh, during fellowship on a physician global assessment score, so it's not, in general, a great um, tool to be used, but it is part of our remission criteria at this point. I mentioned imaging studies. Uh, so there is a concept of what's called subclinical synovitis. Synovitis, again, refers to inflammation of the lining of the joint. And this is where a patient has no or minimal symptoms. Uh, the physician doesn't recognize any arthritis on exam. Their uh, inflammatory markers may be completely normal, but other studies uh, suggest that there may be active synovitis. And those studies include things such as ultrasound, uh, MRI, and there are some experimental biomarkers that have been looked at, so lab tests as well. Not a lot of data on subclinical synovitis and how that uh, refers to actual remission in JIA. Uh, there was one study of a small group of patients uh, who are in clinical and active disease meeting those criteria I mentioned for three months or more. There are 52 joints that were ultrasound. 77% of the patients that were labeled as in clinical and active disease had hyperplasia of the synovium on the ultrasound. They had joint effusions in 67% of patients. Uh, their power Doppler was positive, which means that there was hyperemia or, or suggestion of inflammation of the lining of the joint in 33% of patients, and then tenosynovitis in 15% of, of the patients. About 38% of the patients that were in clinic, clinical and active disease in this study flared by 10 months. And none of these ultrasound findings at, um, at baseline predicted which patients flared or didn't flare. So this is my takeaway that ultrasound looking for subclinical synovitis in patients that you think uh, are in um, remission or clinical and active disease is not ready to be used right now to, to help guide uh, treatment decisions, such as withdrawing medications. Here's uh, some other opinions, mainly based on uh, patient interactions that I have. This is what the family views remission as, generally similar to what us as physicians feel it is, having no pain, no stiffness, no swelling, no disease-related symptoms such as fevers or rashes. Uh, they really want to be off all medications. They want to be going to school or participating in school, uh, playing sports and other activities, hanging out with their friends. I'm going to switch focus a little bit to um, what we have today uh, to, to help us get to remission. This is really the old way that we uh, used to treat um, juvenile arthritis almost before I, uh, well, definitely before I uh, got involved with rheumatology. We started with the uh, least, uh, the medication with the least amount of side effects and worked our way up. And often patients tended to uh, suffer with this approach. And this uh, slide is, I apologize, it's kind of a busy slide, but it does demonstrate this explosion in treatment options. So uh, in the 43 years before I started in pediatric rheumatology, there were uh, 12 different medications available. And then I started in rheumatology in 2005. So in the uh, about uh, 13 years, 12 years since, there's been 13 new medications uh, that were developed to treat inflammatory arthritis. Uh, so there's just been this explosion in the amount of weapons we have to, to treat the disease. I'll focus on just a few medication uh, uh, breakdowns, what's called disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. So conventional disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs are drugs that are uh, focused on delaying or um, discouraging disease progression. Uh, they include, uh, they, are, they have a nonspecific mechanism of action. They're not targeting a specific enzyme or, or uh, 
part of the immune system. Uh, methotrexate, sulfasalazine, and luflinamide are th the main conventional DMARDs. And then uh, just before the turn of the century in the late 90s, the biologic DMARDs really exploded onto the scene. These are genetically engineered proteins that target specific areas of the immune system. They're much more complex, uh, both structurally and, and in order to make them. Uh, than uh, conventional DMARDs, and that translates to uh, much more expensive medications in general. Uh, they have very confusing names. Uh, for example, adalimumab or Humira is the trade name for this drug. Um, it sounds like a completely foreign word. Uh, they, um, the nomenclature does denote the type of protein it is, where the suffix MAB or MAB means that it's a monoclonal antibody, and then right before that, the U denotes that it's a human, uh, a fully human monoclonal antibody. So the names do mean something, despite how confusing they are. Uh, in 2011, um, the American College of Rheumatology uh, put out uh, some uh, recommendations for the treatment of juvenile idiopathic arthritis. It's really on the initiation of treatment and on safety monitoring. They are not meant to be guidelines. They're really a reference uh, and should not be a substitute for individual patient decision making. Uh, they broke the treatment recommendations into five different subgroups. Uh, so systemic JIA with features of uh, systemic disease, fevers and rashes without active arthritis, and then uh, patients who have active arthritis without systemic features, oligoarthritis, polyarthritis, and patients who have active sacroiliitis. There were uh, proposed specific therapy pathways, and the therapy should be adjusted based on disease activity, uh, prognostic factors, and regular follow-up and evaluations. This is just to show this confusing kind of flow diagram of um, how uh, the recommendations were outlined. So the problem is that within two years, there were three new treatments available uh, for systemic JIA, so there was almost an immediate update to this. Um, they also focused on uh, repeat testing uh, for tuberculosis. Generally, that's not indicated uh, in patients on biologic drugs unless there's a risk factor change. And this is, again, just to demonstrate the confusing nature of these recommendations in general. There is another group of recommendations that were made by a um, research group called the Childhood Arthritis and Rheumatology Research Alliance. It's a clinical research network, about 300 pediatric rheumatologists across the country and internationally in Canada as well. They use literature reviews. Uh, surveys and consensus meetings to develop standardized treatment plans. These are not guidelines. There are six current what are called consensus treatment plans or consensus treatment protocols, and there are two in juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Uh, this includes a systemic JIA consensus treatment plan. So the goal behind these is to eventually get to what's called compared effectiveness research. So they made four different proposed treatment uh, recommendations using steroids only to treat JIA, SJIA, methotrexate only, a drug called anakinra, which is an interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, and a drug called tocilizumab, which is a, a monoclonal antibody against the interleukin-6 receptor. Uh, there's frequent um, assessments of the patients that are recommended, and you adjust the treatment as necessary. Of course, there is a confusing flow diagram that goes with this, a little less complicated than the last one. And then there's a polyarticular consensus treatment uh, protocol. And there are three different uh, proposed treatment options, including step-up therapy, where you start with methotrexate, and if um, the disease continues to be active, you add a biologic drug, uh, an early combination group where you start with both methotrexate and a biologic drug and a biologic only uh, treatment group. Again, you assess patients at um, intervals and you adjust the treatment based on their disease activity. And that's a demonstration of that diagram. So uh, I think it's good to take a step back, even though we have lots of uh, treatment 
options and recommendations how to use them, how are we doing right now? So this is data from a uh, Canadian multi-center uh, cohort study uh, that came out in 2015. It was um, almost 1,500 patients. It's called the Reach Out um, Group. And it was uh, patients that were followed from 2005 to 2010. Unfortunately, we don't have any similar data in uh, the U.S. yet. Um, and in general, uh, this showed that uh, patients do attain clinical inactive disease. Um, almost 70 to 90 percent of patients, to, um, uh, regardless of their uh, subtype, achieved clinical inactive disease by around two years. Um, the only group that was kind of an outlier really was the rheumatoid factor positive polyarthritis group, which only got to about 60 percent at two years of inactive disease. And then data from other general um, trials and uh, review articles state in general that um, we're achieving uh, inactive disease in about 21 to 84 percent of patients in these trials and clinical remission in up to about a third of patients in these trials. So I think the cumulative takeaway that, that I um, r received from this data is that inactive disease and remission are goals that are obtainable, and we should really be focused on trying to reach these goals in the clinic with our patients. Once you make it to remission, often the question becomes, now what? And uh, the specific questions uh, that a lot of parents have is, can we stop medications? All medications have side effects. Some of the side effects of our medications are, um, are serious. And, uh, and so the goal of a lot of parents is to get off medications as soon as possible. What is the right time to consider getting off medications? And if you're on a combination of medications, which medicine should be stopped first? So uh, the uh, idea of coming off of methotrexate was looked at in a uh, 2010 uh, prospective study of around 364 patients uh, in JAMA, and they broke down two different groups, um, patients who were stopped from their uh, methotrexate at six months, or patients who stopped their methotrexate uh, after 12 months of being in inactive disease. And what you can see on the graph is basically uh, the flare rate uh, was almost identical between the two groups. There was really a, about within um, two years of stopping the medication, there was about a 55 percent um, flare rate in patients who stopped their medication, uh, regardless of uh, whether or not they stopped it at six months or at 12 months. So in terms of what the optimal time to stop methotrexate or when should you consider it, um, in general, my takeaway from this trial was I would stop it around uh, six months of clinical inactive disease, and it's something that I generally do in, in uh, patients uh, and have the discussion with, with patients to make that shared decision. How about if a patient's on both a methotrexate and a biologic therapy, uh, and specifically in this study, it was a tumor necrosis factor inhibitor drug like uh, adalimumab or tanercept. This is a retrospective study. It's um, it was in 2015, it was about 324 patients, and um, they had two different groups, patients who stopped their TNF inhibitor drug first versus uh, patients who stopped their methotrexate first, and all of these patients were in uh, clinical inactive disease. And basically, uh, you can see here, this dotted line is the patients who stopped their TNF inhibitor drug first, and uh, before two years, uh, um, only about 12 percent of patients were still um, without flare, whereas patients who continued on their, um, their TNF inhibitor and stopped methotrexate first, uh, a much larger percentage stayed in, um, went without a flare. So my takeaway from this trial was that I consider stopping methotrexate before I stop uh, a TNF inhibitor or other biologic therapy. And in general, 
um, our approach uh, in, in our clinic and, and many clinics is to start with methotrexate first in many patients and then add on a biologic drug. And typically, the biologic drug tends to be more effective or get the patient into clinical inactive disease. Uh, and so I think this approach makes sense to stop the drug that didn't work quite as well first and then stop the other one later. So how about withdrawing a biologic drug? And specifically, uh, in this case, it was a tumor necrosis factor inhibitor drug. So this was a um, uh, trial that we took part in, uh, headed out of Cincinnati. It's not been published yet, uh, but is under review right now. And um, these were polyarticular JIA patients, about 120 patients that were in clinical inactive disease for at least six months before they withdrew their medication. And um, they had their medicine stopped uh, and then were followed after that. And uh, you can see over time the um, uh, flare-free survival probability does drop over time. And at about 21 months, 61% of patients had flared. Uh, and then one other uh, important takeaway was of the patients that did flare and were restarted, so the, of these 61% of patients, uh, they were restarted on their medication, uh, their TNF inhibitor, 41% of those patients did not regain their clinical inactive disease after they restarted their treatment by two years' um, time. So this was kind of sobering data uh, and really reminds me that when I'm in the clinic talking to patients, I need to discuss that the risk of flare is real if we stop the medications and that there is a, a possibility up to 40% of patients that won't um, necessarily regain their um, inactive disease state um, if they go back to the same medication that they were on previously. This is in uh, kind of counterintuitive to what uh, I thought prior to this uh, study, that um, patients would almost always get their inactive disease state back, but um, uh, this is not what the data shows. And finally, uh, this goes back to that reach out, that um, Canadian cohort study. Uh, this is just looking at the patients in their trial, uh, in their cohort, that attained remission off all medications. And um, in general, um, the numbers are uh, okay. Uh, by about three years, there is a probability of obtaining around 30 to 40 percent. It really does depend on the specific disease. Uh, and then there is a clear outlier here where uh, rheumatoid factor positive patients in their cohort, none of those patients were, uh, in, were able to obtain remission off medication. So this is, again, sobering data that really uh, brings back the point that the decision to uh, withdraw medications needs to be based on individual patients. So just to summarize this, uh, again, individual patients need to be uh, viewed in order to um, decide. It needs to be a shared decision, a team decision with the family, and uh, it should be based on the medical literature. Just to, again, shift focus one more time, um, we'll talk about kind of what's coming up. So collaborative networks, um, there are many different examples. I think one of the most uh, impressive examples is the children's oncology group in our, our co colleagues in hematology and rheumatology and hematology and oncology. Um, this is an international research organization uh, to design new treatments and cures for cancer in children. It was started initially in 2000 uh, when four clinical trials groups emerged. Um, children under the age of 15 these days up to 95% of them are going to be seen at a COG institution. And survival rates in the last 50 years have risen from 10% to almost 80% in large part to the um, uh, research approaches that this group has made. So the pediatric rheumatology uh, uh, translation of COG is the Childhood Arthritis and Rheumatology Alliance. Um, this is, a, as I mentioned, a group of about 300 pediatric rheumatologists across the country. I'd say compared to 
the COG group, we are in our infancy in general, uh, but uh, within the last uh, four years, a uh, registry has been started where there's now 3,700 uh, patients enrolled at 60 different sites. Um, we uh, uh, are starting our enrollment here, hopefully within the year. Um, the uh, provide data including um, disease data and treatment data and right now it's focused primarily on juvenile idiopathic arthritis and lupus but we plan to expand to other uh, rheumatic diseases as well and the the real I think um, game changers will be uh, this compared effectiveness research and so there's a, a two trials that are uh, have been started based on the registry information the start time optimization in poly JIA or stop JIA, these are comparing those consensus treatment plans that I mentioned earlier in poly JIA. There's 238 patients enrolled at this point. And then first line options for SJIA or FROST. And this is again comparing those consensus treatment plans um, for different treatment options for SJIA. And we have a ways to go on enrollment still. Different type of collaboration is uh, uh, known as learning networks and um, our pediatric gastroenterology colleagues kind of pioneered this with a group called Improve Care Now, um, which really um, aims to improve the care and outcomes of children with inflammatory bowel disease. There's about 300 pediatric gastroenterologists. Our GI group here at PCH is a member of Improve Care Now. Um, there are about 10,000 patients and um, the outcomes in terms of remission rates have improved in three years in Crohn's disease up to 68% and UC up to 72%. Really, the way they improve their, um, uh, their outcomes is by measuring how patients are doing, sharing that da data, and sharing uh, best practices. And so, uh, again, pediatric rheumatology kind of uh, mirrored this with a group called Pediatric Rheumatology Care and Outcomes Improvement Network, or PR Coin, and uh, this is an international patient and healthcare team uh, network that we are a part of here. We've been a part of the last three years, and we're focused on in increasing remission rates, improving functional status, and decreasing level of pains. We collect clinical and treatment data, uh, and we share best practices. We have learning meetings um, and phone calls that we participate in. Uh, and there are 18 current sites. This is uh, unpublished data from the network that shows a wide variety of, um, of remission or clinical and active disease numbers between, uh, this was back in um, 2016, 15 different sites. So th there are some sites that are up to about 60% and other sites that are down at 25%. And the goal will be to get everybody up to to the 60% or higher range by sharing um, best practices. Finally, I want to look at the, uh, the way to get to remission from a completely different angle uh, with a kind of shift in, in paradigm. And I'm going to use, again, rheumatoid arthritis as an example. So uh, the general thought behind the development of the disease is there's some genetic risk there are environmental factors. You develop a state of systemic autoimmunity. In general, most patients with rheumatoid arthritis have signs of autoimmunity with positive uh, autoantibodies, including the rheumatoid factor and CCP antibodies, or cyclic citrullinated peptides. Then they develop uh, symptoms, such as joint pain. Initially, uh, they might not be classified at a particular arthritis and uh, a particular form of arthritis, and then finally they get diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. So the current treatment focus is after they've been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and treating the active disease. And uh, this section when you're, where you have symptoms and signs of autoimmunity has been referred to by some researchers as preclinical disease. So there are some studies that are focusing on preventing rheumatoid arthritis before it starts. So these are patients that have signs, as I mentioned, of autoimmunity with positive antibodies, as well as symptoms. They also have some other sign of um, mild disease activity, either an elevated inflammatory marker, marker or um, imaging studies that show synovitis. But 
Um, importantly, there's no evidence of active arthritis on exam, which is the main way we diagnose and classify patients with um, inflammatory arthritis. And so there's this PRIRI study that was uh, uh, it's unpublished but uh, presented at a European meeting in 2016, which studied 80 patients that fell into this category of having preclinical rheumatoid arthritis. They received a single dose of a drug called um, uh, rituximab, which is a B cell um, monoclonal antibody inhibitor. Uh, and then 40% uh, of patients received um, uh, a placebo. And um, I'm sorry, 40% of the patients who uh, received placebo instead of the uh, rituximab uh, developed rheumatoid arthritis after around 12 months. Only 34% of the patients in the rituximab group developed rheumatoid arthritis um, diagnosed at 17 months. And so the time uh, to diagnosis was delayed of about um, uh, the time until 25% of patients developed rheumatoid arthritis was delayed um, by almost 12 months in the, in the group who received the drug. There are two other uh, studies ongoing now using different drugs, a drug called a Betacept or a, a conventional uh, DMARD called uh, hydroxychloroquine. Um, and, uh, and so those trials are ongoing at this time. So does this represent kind of the next holy grail for, um, for us in pediatric rheumatology? Unfortunately, there are no current or past trials going on for, for juvenile idiopathic arthritis. And that's probably because it's a lot harder to define preclinical GIA. This goes back to that umbrella slide. There are, it's a more heterogeneous disease than rheumatoid arthritis. Um, most patients with, um, with GIA actually don't have many autoantibodies, uh, so it'll be harder to define this group of patients as having preclinical disease. And then the age of onset, as I mentioned early on in the talk, uh, patients are one to five years old. Often they can't tell you about symptoms um, uh, easily, so it makes um, early symptom uh, detection very difficult. So my takeaway from, from this is that it's a very interesting area of research, but it's not quite ready for prime time for us to use now. So getting back to the case, uh, this is a 13-year-old girl with rheumatoid factor negative poly-JIA. Uh, she has been on methotrexate for the past nine months, and her rheumatologist has noticed that she's been in clinical inactive disease for six months. So the parents ask, can we stop her medication? So if you could take out your phones one more time, this is a uh, maintenance of certification uh, part two question. So what is the likelihood of disease flare if the medication is stopped? Again, this is a rheumatoid factor negative poly JIA patient who's on methotrexate alone. like we have a pretty clear consensus, which I would agree with. Uh, based on that trial I did present, about 55% of patients who stopped their medications after six months or 12 months had disease flare. So again, discussing the, um, the possibility of flare and about half of patients coming off medications I think is important in this clinical scenario. Just to review, so I think we went through some definitions in terms of the disease itself, uh, how we define it, as well as what our treatment goals should be at this point in active disease and remission. Uh, I discuss where we are now, how we get there with tools uh, in terms of different disease measures um, and, and some newer tools that are available, um, and uh, that these goals are really achievable. Uh, but need to be discussed uh, in clinic with patients and have a uh, shared decision between the patients and families and the physicians. And some future plans, um, the expanding networks that are available of collaborative care in pediatric rheumatology in terms of research and learning networks, as well as um, looking at possibility in the future of preventing juvenile idiopathic arthritis before it actually starts.
This is, uh, I want to thank everybody for coming this morning. This is, um, I think this is from 2016, our uh, Camp Cruz Juvenile Arthritis Camp that occurs every summer, which is kind of growing patients every year. Uh, and so thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Dr. Branco. I think that's an excellent point, Dr. Branco, uh, kind of going back to uh, what I discussed early, that um, it really is a rule in disease, not a rule out disease, um, that you need to exclude other, um, other diseases. And uh, I would definitely agree that I've had multiple patients uh, present to me first as a rheumatologist with, um, with bone pain or other symptoms, including arthritis, that turned out to have malignancy such as leukemia or lymphoma, so it's a very valid point, I think. Other questions or comments? Great, thank you so much for coming.